now. Well, this is Tonya and welcome back to Nurses Speak. And so today, you know what channel this is? And I have a very special guest with me today. Maggie Lazar is with me today. And Maggie has her own YouTube channel, Single Women Retiring Abroad. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, where Maggie is abroad. But the focus for today's um, topic is going to be more about Maggie's retirement. And like myself, Maggie is a nurse, specifically a nurse practitioner specializing in mental health. And just to give you a little background, I discovered Maggie's YouTube channel because I too am looking to live abroad at some point. And I found that we had a lot in common because in listening to Maggie's videos, she mentioned that she was a nurse and she retired and she's living abroad. So with that being of interest to me, I reached out to Maggie and she was gracious enough to agree to come on Nurses Speak and share her story with us. So thank you, Maggie. My pleasure. I appreciate you being here today. And so we're going to jump right in to our questions. So if you'd like to say anything um, before we get started. Well, uh, like she said, my name is Maggie. I am a retired nurse practitioner and I've been living full-time in Panama, the country for almost two years now. Uh, I was a nurse for over 40 years and did multitude of things like most of you. And when uh, Tana reached out to me, I felt privileged because to me, we need to support each other and whatever I can do to help her achieve her goals, whether it's for the YouTube channel or her repatriation or retirement abroad, I'm all for it. So I'm wide open. Fire away. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. And one other thing I want to mention too, everyone, is that both Maggie and I started our YouTube channels um, with the motivation from participating in a YouTube creation ch challenge that was sponsored by Stephanie Perry. So many of you, if you're not familiar with Stephanie Perry, check out her channel as well. She works with a tremendous amount of wonderful women who do all sorts of things, uh, travel abroad, house sitting. She has an Exodus Summit. I mean, you name it. So, started today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Started today. Mm -hmm. So she's not hard to find. All right. <laughs> so again, check out Stephanie Perry's channel and the services that she's offered. And if that's an area of interest to you, I'm... Um, absolutely certain you won't be disappointed. So to get right into discussion with Maggie. All right, you mentioned how many years you've been a nurse and an NP. So let me just ask you this, Maggie. What did you enjoy most and least about your experience uh, practicing as a nurse? Now, now, you can differentiate because you've done both. Mm -hmm working as a nurse and working as a nurse practitioner, obviously we know that's two different levels of practice. So give me a little bit of background about what, I guess, your experience as a nurse, what prompted you to really pursue your NP licensure? And what did you like most and least about either of those? Or mm -hmm. both, if you prefer to you know, share. Well, when I was uh, in high school, or when I was approaching finishing high school, I really wanted to be a physician. But I was born in the Caribbean island of Haiti, and my mother was a single mom. When she decided to send me over to the U.S. to go to college, it was a little bit difficult to go that path because of cost and other things. 
So nursing became my second career. Actually, before nursing, I had studied engineering and I was going to be uh, an electrical engineer. And I remember I got an associate degree in, I don't know if it was pre-engineering or whatever. And I was living in New York at that time, New York State. And I went and interviewed for my first job and they took me to the, I don't know what they would call it, but it was down in the basement. You know, they have basements in New Jersey. And uh, when when the when the interviewer walked down with me, I was wearing my little suit. I was so excited. I was going to be uh, uh, working with boards and putting, you know, input here and there. And I walked in and it was a room full of guys and they looked and then their eyes rounded <laughs> and then they turned around. And I had this feeling in the pit of my stomach saying, I don't want to work here. <laughs> I don't want to work here. So I went back and went to nursing and found my calling. Um, so I got my associate degree in New York and then I went to my bachelor's in New York. And when we moved to Florida, that's when I got, I got an MS, uh, an MS before in health administration. And then the NP really, I start, I went that route towards the end of my career. So most of my career have been, has been in uh, critical care, cardiology, and home care. I did a lot of home care, and I own a home care company for 13 years. So when, when I think of my jobs, my first job was in a medical surgical unit like most, most of us do. We used to. Now people go straight into ICUs and specialties. When I was coming out, I don't even like that term, but they always recommended that you went into med surg just to kind of have a broader experience. Yeah. And I remember I love my job. I worked for a, a local hospital and my I had a good boss. I was going to school for my bachelor's at that time. And she was very accommodating in terms of me coming in late, somebody taking a report for me. And, and now when I look back and I see everything that the nurses are going through, those were different days because now they're probably not going to be as accommodating to uh, and supporting of a nurse in school, which I find heartbreaking. Uh, then I moved to uh, the CCU and I absolutely adored cardiology. Give me a heart and I'm happy. Uh, so I did that for a while. And then from cardiology, that's when I went into home care. I was a young mom, I had young kids and like most people needing flexibility. But I love the two jobs that I had before. So when I went into home care, it was just out of a need to be accessible for my kids. It wasn't because I knew about home care and I loved home care. But again, again, I fell in love with it because from the ICU to the home, I'd go see a patient and I'm like, she was my patient in the unit. And of course I'll say, do you remember me? They're like, no, you know, because I was pushing so much Dilaudid on them because we did intervention, interventional cardiology, pulling sheath and all that kind of stuff. But I love the fact that I could be eyeball to eyeball with this little old person and explaining their disease to them and empowering them at whatever level of capacity they were at for them to say, oh, I know to call you if I gain a couple of pounds. Oh, I know to check the label, you know, to check for the salt content. So that fed my soul. So I have loved every job that I have had. And then I moved into a supervisory position. Then I created a cardiac specialty program, having a ball the whole way until I became an entrepreneur and started my own company. And then even then, I love being my own boss. I love creating. I love just, because, you know, when you love something, it doesn't become drudgery. You don't dread going to work. You love going to work. And on the weekends, I can work extra. So that was the, the challenge, just not to overwork. Um, so I love my initial job because I had good bosses. That's why I think when I became an entrepreneur, I understood the value of supporting your staff. And I always used to say, it starts from the top, right? Absolutely. If you can set the tone for your organization, for your unit, for your team, as to what's gonna happen, how we're gonna treat each other, 
how we're going to treat the patient. Because I always used to tell my home care people, because they would be going into some crazy homes, right? And I used to say, behind all the stuff that you've seen, maybe what they're saying to verbally, the home situation and all that, you got to peel off all those layers and see this human being who needs you. So I think all my jobs had prepared me for to be a, uh, you know, an entrepreneur. And even to this day, the people who worked for me for the 13 years will tell you, they'll say, oh, the best boss I've had and that kind of thing. So, because I understood, I was a mom, I had kids, I had an assistant, she had like small kids. I would let her come in, you know, go to appointments and some of my staff would resent that. But I had to be a human to her. So yes, I have loved every job. My last job as an NP was a little bit more challenging because I was seasoned, I was older, I was less patient. I knew how they could do things better and that wasn't going over very well. And I think that was a little bit of the reason why I decided to say, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm going to retire. <laughs> okay, okay. Right. Yeah, that's, and yeah, that's my whole career. Oh, okay, I hear you. I definitely hear you when it comes to, you know, that needing that flexibility and um, understanding the human aspect of the people that we work with, because um, one of the things I believe in, you know, treat people the way you would want to be treated. That's so important. And when you have examples like that in the workplace, especially mm -hmm. in a healthcare field and in nursing, where it can be so stressful because yeah. there's so much regulation and so many demands from different directions that sometimes we lose sight of the value yeah, of the people, mm -hmm. not only the people that we take care of, the people that work, work for right. us or with us, yeah. right? And yeah. understanding that they have the same needs, you know? So that little bit of extra compassion definitely goes a long way. So I could, I could see why people wouldn't forget you because that honestly, that's rare. <laughs> And when you when you have your own business, you can't afford to do that and you want to model it, right, for your employees. I remember going to Europe and I said, okay, I took the same assistant. I said, here's a check. I give her a blank check. I said, in case anything unexpected happens, here are the keys. And I said, I have an international phone. Don't call me unless the place is burning. Whatever it is, you handle it because you know my, my my philosophy, you know what I think. And that's true. I was gone for three weeks and they didn't call me one time. Wow. Trust. That's a lot. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Trust goes a long way for sure. <laughs> wow. That's amazing, Maggie. So uh, yeah. now that you've gotten to the point of you've had enough, right? <laughs> yeah. What? What led you to choose early retirement? You know, you could have transitioned into something else, mm -hmm. but you decided to choose retirement. Mm -hmm. And for some people, you know, oh, I should say for everybody, retirement looks different because some right. people, as we know, they quit, they're done, they're not doing anything but go fishing. Some right. people, they retire and they pick up a little part-time something here or there, yeah. or they have other interests, you know, that keep them really busy. But you not only retired from nursing, you did something else. You, <laughs> you, you moved abroad, okay? And Panama wasn't even your first stop. So tell us a little bit about that, you know, what it was like to de decide to retire from a career that you loved yeah, and also to consider your options in moving abroad. Well, that last job, you know, I, I talked about being an entrepreneur. I owned my home care company for 13 years. And then through a set of circumstances, I said, you know what, it's time. So I sold it. And then I took some time off. I traveled and my mom got sick and I took care of her. So I didn't work for a couple of years. And then I decided to do something that, that was a dream of mine. I went to culinary school. I'm like, why not? I have the time and I have the coins. Let's do it. So I went to Puerto Rico for a year. And then after that, it was like, okay, what are you going to do with this? So I decided to go into the food service business, being the serial entrepreneur. I opened a cafe. 
So I ran that for a couple of years and I told my family, I said, okay, this is the last thing I'm going to do. I'm, I promise I'm going to stay put after that. I'm not going to do anything else. And then again, you know, life happens. We ended up closing the cafe and that was the was a heartbreaking thing for me. And I, I, I mourn that because again, I tell people I had not failed at anything in my life up to that point. And I consider that a cat cat catastrophic failure, even though I know, I knew even my daughter would tell you, I gave it my all. But I think it was important for me to go through that path because it, it, it tests your resilience and it also humbles you, right? If you think you're all that and people like you or you love your job and then all of a sudden you fall flat on your face, your friends, your colleagues, everybody's watching and you're like, yes, I did fail, but it wasn't through me not, you know, trying. So when I came off that pity party that I had for a couple of months, I sat at my kitchen table and cried and whined. And then one day I woke up and I said, okay, man, you the pity party is over. You brush yourself off and what are you going to do now? And that's when I went to uh, nurse practitioner school. Because, you know, I I researched another business, another franchise, this, this, and that, and nothing really panned out. And I didn't want to go back into the food industry. So I went to, uh, to nurse practitioner school and then started working in mental health. Now, I had been a workhorse. I had been a workaholic my whole life. I love working and I was blessed doing work that I love because to me, the work that I do, the decisions I make, the medication I prescribe was all to improve someone's life. And that's why nursing is such a very rewarding job, career, whatever you want to call it, because we are able hopefully to peel off all the regulations and the uh, microaggressions and, and, and on a, you know, crazy expectations. Again, like I said, if I can touch Mrs. Joan, hold her hand for two minutes, look in her eye and transfer a sense of empathy and caring to me, that that's it. Right. So I was thinking in my mind, there is no way I can retire. I would be so bored. Oh my God, what would I do with myself? Because I was the one with the schedule. I have to be doing something all the time. So when I was walk, uh, driving to one of my uh, uh, my um, facilities and in my job as a psych NP, and I did it with uh, the long-term care facility. So I could have like three or four facilities in one day that you have to travel from one to the other. And many times I would hit that traffic and I would be stuck in there for an hour, two hours. And it gets a little bit irritating. You know, you sit there, you know, I would record a lot of videos while I'm sitting in the car. Uh, and, and one day, I, I don't know what happened. I just said, what am I doing here? I'm 62. I can quit this. I'm, I'm done. So I went home, did my research, checked social security. And then you ask about how I was able to do it. Now, remember I had a business, I sold it. So I had a little bit of cushion, right? And I understand that some people are not in that same situation that you need your paycheck and whatever the situation is at work, you can't afford to leave it. I was not in that particular uh, situation. So I was blessed that way. So I went and did the numbers. I was like, can I do this? Because my retirement age was projected to be five years down the line, 67 and eight months, exactly. So if you take social security earlier, they ding you, of course, right? Because you're not working the full retirement. And when I did the numbers, knowing my lifestyle and no debt and this and this and that, I said, I think I can do it. So that's what I did. But even before that, I'm a planner. So I'm always looking ahead. And I was thinking, okay, I have five years to decide how I'm going to retire. So I would, that's when I went to Africa. I said, well, let me check to see, you know, if I can go somewhere else because huh, that was like after 2016, you know what I mean? So it was like a lot of us started looking Sure. outward 
And it was like Lowering our options. Right. You because before none of us thought that way, right? Mm. Now it was like, well, maybe there is another option. We don't need to feel stuck in this situation where you stress out all the time. You wake up every day, you don't know what else you're gonna see in the news. So that's when I decided I'm gonna check some other places, but Panama was not one of those places. And then COVID happened too. Right. I caught COVID at one of my facilities. I was in the hospital for four days. I was not on a ventilator, thank God, but COVID put a lot of things into perspective for a lot of us, right? It That's did. why you had the great resignation. People were like, yes. look at this job. They made me reuse masks and, you know, uh, all the infection control procedures were horrible and they weren't listening and that's how I caught it. And then I remember no one called to check to see how I was doing. We had lost someone in that facility to COVID. And in the last day I was being discharged, someone called me and said, oh, you better, when are you coming back? And I said, oh, you didn't give me a phone call to see if I was dead or alive. You did not show any concern or empathy. Therefore, I'm going to make that decision for you. So when I got home, I got on my computer, sent a note and say, since you didn't care whether I lived or died, I'm not coming back. That's how I left that job. So when I was a nurse practitioner and I decided that I wasn't going to, you know, be stuck in traffic, traveling like an hour and a half to go to a facility and being on the road three to four hours and then going home, having to spend six hours writing my notes. And it became really repetitive. And yes, I love seeing the patient, but that was a really small portion of my day. A lot of my day was writing notes and, you know, being the nurse, seasoned nurse, I knew I had to write good notes. Absolutely. And yes. Talked about a different level. When you become an NP, it's a whole different ballgame. You're a provider now. Mm -hmm. So you can't hide behind my boss said, my supervisor did. No, it's you. So Correct. it became a little bit of a drudgery. So I went to uh, Africa and checked a couple of places and my spirit didn't resonate with them. And I came to Panama in 2019 and I love the tropical nature, the food, the people. I don't know how to explain it to anybody, but there was an instant connection. Mm. So that was before I went to Africa. I went to Africa, didn't work out. I'm like, okay, let me go back to Panama and check it out again. And then when I came back, the same connection was even stronger. So I was just laying the groundwork for wherever I was going to end up. And when I made that decision and that day did the numbers, I'm like, oh, I'm going to Panama. So I did the work that was needed to see where I was career-wise and I looked at options. So I think that's what is important for people to do. Some people can do a beeline to a place because let's say they visited that place when they were out of college and they took a year out and they traveled to Europe. They say, one day I'm going to go back there. I didn't have that right. experience. Okay. It was just something that I did concurrently. And that's why I ended up in Panama. And I have not regretted my decision one day. And you know, something you said that's very important that a lot of times we as nurses tend to overlook and that's acknowledging how you felt when you went someplace mm -hmm. and this could be another country this could be another job this could that's be funny. any sort of environment that we place ourselves in because oftentimes we listen at what is out there in the media and you know we we succumb to the propaganda of things the advertisement that's beautiful and 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 uh, you know attractive and we 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 consider exploring right and that's great but it's also important to give um credence to how you feel when you arrive in a place mm -hmm. similarly to when you said you didn't feel right when you walked into that room of engineers. I know. As a young <laughs> and that woman, was it. I was out of there. 
and, and now I don't have someone, to anyone, yes, so. exactly. And mm -hmm. and you listen then, and That's now right. as someone in their early sixties, seasoned, Definitely. experienced, financially independent, you went somewhere, and you didn't feel it either. And so that's something that resonates with me too, because, you know, as healthcare professionals, the, the education and training that we have is a lot of times centered around logic, mm -hmm. research, mm -hmm. you know, getting the facts, understanding what's going on. And I'm pretty sure you did your research and got facts about Africa as well, because there's many, many oh, countries. I thought in I Africa. was going to love it. You thought you were exactly right. <laughs> But when you got there and you had a different feeling, you listened to that feeling I and did. you didn't ignore that feeling. And that's something that I think is a really key point. And I'm glad you mentioned that in discussing and, your experiences. And I think as nurses, we, a lot of us, I don't know, 100% of us, but a lot of us have that intuition um, you know, like when you walk into a patient's room, you look at that patient, the vitals could be okay, but you took a one look and I can tell you how many times I've said that something is a mess. Something is not wrong. I remember I was in the CCU one time. We had a man that came with chest pain. We treated him and he was ready to go to the PCU. He was sitting there dressed. We were looking for a portable monitor to put on him. Put on him. The doctor walked in. And then all of a sudden he yelled out. But during that morning, the nurse was saying, I don't know, he just doesn't look quite right. Uh, is, he, is he supposed to be transferred? I'm like, well, the doctor is going to come in, let him assess him. And that man flatlined while the doctor was in there. And they said his myocardium just exploded oh, and he wow. died. So I'm wow. saying this to say that nurses have a heightened sense of intuition that we need to acknowledge and explore further. And as women also, how many times if you're married, you tell your husband, you're like, no, I don't know about this guy. And then your husband's like, what's wrong? And the next thing you know, he's you turn out to be, you know what I mean? So that's why we tell men, listen to your wives. We are we are wife. We have we are blessed with the sixth sense. We can smell something. Yeah. So I am one that I always, and, I, and you know, in my group, single women retiring abroad, you talked about people checking a place out. I try to tell them all the time, know thyself, listen to the data. Don't ignore what you see, what you smell, what you know, what you touch, because it's trying to tell you something. So yes, I am very aware People call it vibration or whatever. I'm not into new age, so I don't call it that. But yes, I can read people very well. And I listen to my intuitions. And I'm not one to just be making decisions in the spur of the moment. I do my research. I get my data. And then I let the spirit guide me. That's why I'm here. And people say, how do you like it? I say, I love it. Well, what about this and this and that? Well, it depends. What are your priorities? Exactly. And no place is perfect, regardless of where we go, no, right? No. So no, it's all why. about at the end how this. you feel while you're there. Yeah. You know, are you comfortable yeah. or not? Do you feel safe or not? And you must have, too. I mean, you have to couple the how you feel with, you know, the concrete yeah. stuff that you are need. Are your needs being met? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more because that's what makes the difference even in our jobs, the you know, organizations mm -hmm. that we work with, you know, I mean, life is life. And regardless of where we are, we need to be able to feel comfortable, to feel safe and to have our needs met. And however mm -hmm. that looks for us individually, right. that becomes the, the, the way in which I think it's important that we think and not so much on where the masses are going, you know, or where the advertising right. is pulling us. Follow the flow, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more because I've been some places where I felt like, that was nice, but I don't feel like I need to go back. Right? <laughs> you know, I have nothing <laughs> bad to say, to but it's just like, I don't feel anything here. So yeah. it was a nice visit, yeah. but right. let me go next on the list. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, it. so I appreciate that. So now you're retired, you're relocated to Panama. What are you doing with that free time, Maggie? Oh my God. Remember <laughs> what I said about me being worried that I would be bored? Uh-huh. And again, because I'm so into myself, I know for me, retirement could not look like, okay, I'm going to play golf. We're going to play pickleball. What are we going to eat? Ah, I'm an introvert. I have an insatiable need to learn and to create. Mm -hmm. And I knew I could not come to Panama and just worry about going to the beach, you know, sipping margaritas and just have a life of leisure. That would absolutely drive me bananas. Okay. Even though I'm 66, thank goodness my mind is still working. I forget a few things sometimes, but every time I forget something and it comes to me, I'm like, okay, I'm still here. I'm still here. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm a dementia specialist. I treat the uh, dementia. And every time I'm like, you know, I didn't put the key in the microwave. And so, <laughs> so I knew I could not be one to just not have projects and stuff. So that's why when I knew I was going to retire in Panama, came, did my residency, I was looking for something to uh, dedicate my experience to, to serve, to volunteer. And I started researching while I was planning my exit to Panama. I started researching where I could, because I've always been a traveler. I love to go abroad, uh, where I could volunteer, you know, outside of the U.S., and I, I think I checked a lot of things. And that's how I came across the Peace Corps. So they were looking for volunteers to go teach HIV. Um, you know, they had, uh, you had choices all over the world. But again, because I have my heart set on Africa, I said, you know, they ask you what your first and second choice is. I said, Africa. But what I did not say is, was they should speak English or French, because I know some French. So I just left it open and ended up in South Africa, which I was excited because they speak English in South Africa. But so I moved to Panama in January, 2023, but I knew I, with all the process of getting approved with the Peace Corps, that was a long process, especially the medical clearance. You got to go do all this stuff, colonoscopy, mammogram and everything. So. I knew I was going to deploy, which is the word I use because it's like a military type of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, model. Um, so I left. I stayed in Panama for six months to like June, July. Then I went home. And then after a month, I, I went to South Africa with the Peace Corps. And it was going to be a two-year assignment, you know, from 2023, 2025. But to, again, other circumstances, after three months, I was like, this is not going to work. And I left the Peace Corps and returned to Panama in November. So when I came back, it was like, okay, so that didn't work. What else? What's the next? And that's what excites me, the search, uh, the curiosity. So I started researching what else I was going to do. So I gave myself time to explore the whole country. I traveled to our Panama. I checked the interior, the beach areas to see where I would want to put myself. And I came back to the city. After the experience in, in South Africa where the lack of amenities made me run for the hills, I was like, okay, I don't want to rough it out. I don't want to put me myself in a situation where I'm gonna have issues with water, electricity and bugs. So it's like, I'm staying in the city. So I'm in a city, I'm in a high rise. I said, I'd never be in a high rise. I said, I would never want to take an elevator up to my apartment. And that's exactly what I'm doing now. Okay, okay. <laughs> so you can change. Don't mm -hmm. be so set in your ways. You can adjust and adapt. So I'm going to tell you before, I have a beautiful ocean view and I'm like, I never thought I could have that. So I'm counting my blessings. But yeah. I knew I needed to do something else. When I left my job, even now, my license is still active. I was hoping to continue doing like some part-time or remote work. 
But anyway, I'm not going to say anything negative about the person who was above me, but that was an option, but she chose not to choose that option. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Um, so I started researching things to do on YouTube. How to, I did like a online course for nurse supervisors. Uh, so that kept me busy doing all the modules. And then I um, started researching YouTube. I had, you know, you said something about we met on Stephanie's uh, challenge, but I already had a, a, a YouTube channel in 2019. And it kind of changed over time. 2019, it was my name. Then when I closed my cafe, I changed the name to a nurse in the kitchen because mm -hmm. I was hoping mm -hmm. right. to merge my two loves, cooking and nursing, to be like personal chef or whatever. That didn't pan out. When I went to South Africa, I had to shut that down. And I said, okay, I'm going to share my experiences as a volunteer. So I changed, you know, I created a new channel that I call in-service retirement, where I was going to say, oh, we're going to be doing this. We did, I did a beautiful training in South Africa that was so, um, it touched my soul because, you know, I think I touched some other people that, that we taught. And, you know, I got to that little village and the ladies are like, we want to hear about depression, anxiety. We have people committing suicide. And I'm like, right up my alley. <laughs> I was like, you know, you see how things just work out. Yes, yes. Doing a whole, a week long training for this group of young people from 18 to like 30. And we had so many issues with domestic violence and uh, HIV was rampant. And there was a lot of cultural stuff going on, whereas you could not, it was very difficult to get a man to wear a condom or they have uh, polygamy. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and right? It was a challenge. And of course, you know, the, the, the young ladies, it was uh, a patriarchal society, the men and then the ladies. So for me to come in and really tell them for five days, Monday to Friday, your body is your own. You know, and then we tell them about prep. You know, if you have a husband and he is infected, you can protect yourself. They demonstrate how to use a condom and telling them you, you can get a job so you don't depend on someone for your livelihood. Therefore, you exposed to all kinds of things. And then towards the end, watching the light go off in their eyes and, oh, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I was like, oh, my God, that is so heartwarming you know I felt so good even though I didn't stay but I think I mm -hmm. touched some people I, absolutely so when I came back in November I was like okay that's over what are you gonna do and that's when again I had to change the name of the channel because now I was not gonna be in service retirement and I started doing the research watching videos reading comments watching all the Facebook posts and then I took that challenge from uh, Stephanie in February, okay. when she said, it's not to get found on YouTube, but it's about collaboration. Were mm -hmm. you in that one? Yes. Yes. She talked about collaboration. Collaboration. Yes. But yeah. I don't know if you recall, she said that when she was starting her channel, she did a 26 day post challenge she posted mm -hmm. a video every single day and then she said i remember she said i wouldn't recommend that she said because that right. doesn't mean you're going to be successful exactly and my little ear heard that's exactly what i'm going to do mm. so i said i am going to i didn't do so many collabs right after mm -hmm. that challenge but i went back and i said i'm going to create this channel I found the name and I knew who my audience was going to be. And I said, I'm going to do a 30 day challenge to myself. I'm going to post a video every single day. But by that time, all my research had confirmed my audience needs and the questions I was going to answer for them. Mm -hmm. So I started writing down different topics and I came up with like 63 topics. So I was, I had the topic. And because I'm an educator, I can wing anything, right? I can talk right? to the camera. I can relate to people. So that wasn't an issue for me. 
So that's what I did. And then I continued on when the 30 day was, was over. I said, I'm going to do it once a week. And I kept doing okay. it once a week until that thousand subscriber, 4,000 yeah. hour happened. And I tell you right now, between creating, because the goal of my group, Single Women Retiring Abroad, we started with the YouTube channel, but we are creating community on the ground. So when okay. people re watch my videos, those are the people who are like, oh, we think we can, we'd like to move to Panama. And then the very first video, I take him through an assessment. I say, you need to do a self-assessment to see if this is really for you, because it's not for everybody. Right. It's just like if you want to be an entrepreneur, take that self-assessment. It's not for everybody. Not everybody can be their own boss and live mm -hmm. with the uncertainty, right? So now right. you're going to move thousands of miles away. Are you going to, going to be handled to handle it mentally, leaving your family, everything that's familiar to you? And then right. they through. I, I had different playlists. It's so, an adjustment, yeah. Yeah. So now we we up to like almost 45 members uh, and then, you know, they have to be single, wanting to retire abroad, already here or in process. And then when they come here, I say, you know, by yourself, we want you to have a soft landing. You have a community. And what we want to do ultimately with our group is that if we want to stay here and die here, we want to create the community and the support services because I'm a home care manager i know what people need at the end of right. life yeah so getting your paperwork in order because you don't have dnrs over here we don't you know advanced directive right. is not really something they think okay. about. so working with the attorney and saying no what do i need here so all these legal things services support uh, mobility issues so I am engulfed in learning and creating. So now I am not bored and I don't have, I don't say I don't have downtime. I think the good thing about being retired is that now because I'm so busy, people coming in, can we have lunch? I have to have a calendar. So- <laughs> Well, that's great. <laughs> I know, right? I met this woman the other day at a coffee. She's like, oh, I'm glad you're doing that. But me, no. I just want to know what am I going to eat next? And I'm like, oh, that was just, that is not me. Know thyself. So you can go eat everywhere you go. Me, I'm on the computer. I'm doing research. And that excites me. But I have some days I wake up and I'm like, eh, I want to do it. I mean, my PJs, I just veg out. Yeah. And you have the choice. Home. That's and the key thing. I don't There's a choice yeah. about it. I, I like being in my own simple environment, you know, have the news there, practicing my Spanish, um, you know, and I have all kinds of things, you know, electronics. You know, I could be working on the computer. I'm watching a, a Korean show over here. The news is over there. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, no, yeah. I don't, I am not bored at all what I thought retirement was going to be is totally different but you have to create your own yes. instead of waiting for it to happen you have to say what do I want to do because there is so much I want to do I want our group to have volunteering projects you know working mm -hmm. with maybe the youth or the indigenous people but Panama is different in the sense that things move more slowly so mm -hmm. as someone who is, you know, who's lived so many years, I understand that sometimes you have to slow it down before you can really get to the information that you want, especially mm -hmm. in a different culture. So I'm giving right. myself time. And while I'm doing that, mm -hmm. I travel and I created a little company I call Travel Companion where, you know, I can take an older person on a plane for, you know, for a trip and then take her to her loved one and come back. So I'm doing all kinds of things. And I'm just, I'm just so excited about my life right now. So I'm not missing out on anything. So if you're thinking about retirement, think about it carefully. Mm -hmm. What do you need to keep you engaged? What's going to feed your soul? How much money do you need? Do you need to be listen to those, uh, Financial planners, you need a million dollars. You don't. 
right right people want to be there some women here who say oh i live in a seven thousand square foot penthouse i'm like you do you sis you're gonna have to keep it clean no right. i don't need and that's the thing to give yourself pause to know yourself to know what your needs and preferences are mm -hmm. and build upon that because at the you know it's it's like we get to a stage in life and some people discover this early on so i'm not knocking those who had a very early awakening right. but for many of us who put others first for many, many oh, years right. of our lives, yeah. right? It's like getting to a time where you recognize the importance of you is such a special time. And it doesn't need to be rushed through. It and should be savored and appreciated. Yeah, that's As you said, the blessing of having that time and freedom. Oh my gosh, yes. But you, you craft your life to say, how much do I need? to be happy, to be, and, and happy is not a word I use, content. Content, Contentment yes. is different from being happy, right? Mm -hmm. So you could be happy. My house is still in Florida. Thank God it survived the hurricane. But uh, yes. I can live in a one bedroom apartment I'm, and I'm fine. I'm a cook. I like to cook my own meals. I don't need to be going to fancy restaurants and paying money and eating food that is bad for me. Right. I don't need to socialize three, four, five times a week to be going out to the rooftop bars and I don't need any of that. Right. So I have simple taste. So know what you need and see where your money can take you. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's very comfortable. It's simple. I don't need a lot. And I thank God for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one last thing, Maggie, and I appreciate everything you said, and I know it's of great value to the listeners and viewers, but I just want to ask you one more thing. Okay. What lessons have you learned on your path to retirement? And what advice would you share with nurses who are contemplating retirement, but having ambivalence about it? And you can just share maybe two or three things that are of significance to you. I mean, you know, I still belong to a lot of nurse forums and groups and Facebook group. And the comments are heartbreaking, what nurses are going through in terms of the stress and especially long-term care. I don't know about acute care now, but the regulations and uh, the acuity of the patients and uh, the workload. And, and in addition to that, you have all the corporate regs and stuff, but then you have the families on this side, the human element, which is what I teach in my class for nurse supervisors. I'm like, you can be an excellent clinician, but the soft skills you need to deal with all these personalities and expectations, that's what's going to make you burn out quicker. It's not the 12, 13 hour shifts. So I think nurses, we have to take control of our own life and emotions. One of the things that uh, Stephanie Perry's group talked about is for women to, you know, get rid of the cake. You know, we, we want to be, like you say, everything to everybody, right? Oh, we need to go to back to school, get the master's degree. We need to get a full-time job. We need to get the manager position. Our kids need to be, you know, making A's and we, we, the president of the PTA and we doing two, three sports, you know, with the kids uh, and you sitting on boards and stuff. And I did a bunch of that. But now looking back, I would have pulled back and enjoyed the journey more because a lot of times we neglect our relationships, our own health, especially nurses. This girl says every time she goes to work, she goes into a panic attack. She has to go into a bathroom and blow into a brown bag because her anxiety is so high. If that's the case and you can't control it, you got to start making plans for your exit mm -hmm. because it will kill you, right? So taking control of your own life and emotions, see where you at, are you comfortable where you at, where do you want to go? 
that's even before you even consider retirement, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of us are in the sandwich uh, uh, generation, right? We have the right. aging parents and then we have the teenagers. Woo! And I survived three, we're survivors, okay? So, <laughs> I know. So I get it. But everything you have to pace it out, realize that you're not going to be able to achieve everything at once. So sometimes yes. I tell my ladies, you may want to retire now, but based on every all the research you do, maybe you're not ready yet. Maybe you need to de define a plan to say in two years, in three mm -hmm. years, and make the plan and work the plan. Because I think just knowing that you're working towards your exit gives you, yes. Yes. you know, setting the intention. Right, because you're looking and say, oh, in 2025, you know what I'm saying? So it gives you a little bit more um it steadies you gives you more calm whereas you would have reacted to someone says and you're like mm, that's all right i'll be out in 2025 so right know, it's your right. Own so i think that's the most important thing and then don't forget the financial situation it is so important you can't think of retirement if you're loaded with debt you got to attack that first right mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. you got to mentally prepare yourself what does retirement look like for you? Like I explained earlier, what do you need to feel content? Can you craft another lifestyle for yourself mm -hmm. that's going to be fulfilling? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, talk to your, your family and friends because you got to prepare them. Say, you know what? In two years, I'm going to retire and that's what I'm going to be doing. Mm -hmm. another and thing in some cases, Maggie, just to point out the opposite, you may not want to tell all family and friends. Certain family and friends. In you some don't. cases, you might want to just certain ones, and you know who they are, right? Right. Um, but I think sometimes if I just say it based on your response, that's the last time we talk about it. Right? <laughs> it was just an FYI. We don't uh -huh. need to have a discussion. Right. I'm exactly. They don't need to know when or where. No, this was just an FYI, right? Yes. So, but it's so important. And then, you know, like I said, craft your plan, work your plan. And, and I think for me, when I was trying to exit, getting rid of my stuff was the most emotionally, um, it was the most emotional part of the whole process. I'm a cook. So I had gadgets, you know, plates mm. and stuff. And getting rid of all that, you gotta you gotta mourn. Yeah, yeah. Be, be in tune with your emotions. And some people need a coach to go through that. Some people, maybe it brings up a bunch of unresolved stuff in your life. Yeah, yeah. Because now it's okay to go talk to someone where in my generation was like, oh God, she's crazy. She's not strong. Mm -mm. Get rid of the cape. Yeah, get rid of the cape. Yeah, get rid yeah. of the cape. You want so to get true. to the point where you could see yourself for who you are, and only then can you learn new skills to build resilience where you don't care what people think. Mm. You don't become so self centered, but you're like, It's me, I got to take care of me. You know, I was telling someone there is a young lady who lives in my building, she left her job at 55, she retired. That's early, right? Mm -hmm. And then she said, When she came here. She said, I must have slept for a whole year. Wow. Doesn't that say a lot? That what says a lot. Ourselves for decades, all that cortisol, epinephrine, and all the bad stuff spewing in your body cannot kill yeah. you. So you have got to be in tune with yourself. So I learned to be, I've always been in tune with myself. So that's not a challenge. I've mm -hmm. always been a, a risk taker. That's not a challenge. I've traveled, so I wasn't worried about coming to a new country. I think my my one of my challenges was what is retirement gonna look like? And I knew I was gonna be the one to create it for myself, that mm -hmm. I needed to develop new passions mm -hmm. and new interests that didn't mm -hmm. just center about family and nursing. Mm -hmm. So explore, powerful. right? Yeah, absolutely, that's powerful. Travel to explore. 
Give yourself the freedom to do that. And then you're going to find yourself. Yes, yes. And definitely, as you said, stay in touch with your feelings yes. and your intuition. Listen to that Acknowledge inner guide. Them. Acknowledge that inner guide. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> well, it's so it was so great speaking with you. I had a lovely time. Uh, I'm looking forward to when I can come to Panama and we can. That would be lovely. Oh, I Panama. don't know. Everybody comes with my, on my in my comments. Oh, I can't wait. I'm coming. I said, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Wow. Well, Maggie, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. I know this was a treat. This was a masterclass in so many <laughs> areas of topics. <laughs> So and I'm we talked about a lot of stuff. So oh we yeah, we did. We covered it. We covered it. Yeah, we definitely did. I appreciate so mm, much your time today. Okay. So thank you, everyone. This video will be up shortly, and with a description, of course, and mention to Stephanie Perry. We give a lot of thanks to Stephanie for paving the way for so many of us to not only create YouTube channels, but to travel the world unapologetically yeah. and unafraid. And she always says, we don't mind taking the credit. <laughs> exactly, that's right. Cause it's all about helping others, helping ourselves and helping each other. Exactly. That's it, that's yeah. it. Okay. So thank you again, Maggie. And I uh, would love to have you back. I don't know what else we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come up with something. We'll come up with something. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. All right. Adios. Okay.